If any member of the public has an item to bring up that's not on the agenda, uh, please do so now. Otherwise, you'll have an opportunity to talk about anything that is uh, on the agenda, including the check valves and the climate adaption plan. And to the members of the public, there should be a uh, raise your hand feature. And from there, I can allow you to speak. Uh, I'm not seeing any hands raised. If, if we're having some diff technological difficulties and people uh, have a question to bring up later, we'll recognize that. Uh, but uh, let's go forward to the climate adaption plan and uh, what was presented. I want to compliment the consultants and engineering on really a, a sort of a great uh, uh, format for the citizens of Corte Madera to, to look at the proposals, the ideas, the concepts, and interact and leave comments in regard to that. I, I thought that was really uh, an excellent uh, program presentation that they put together on top of the uh, uh, workshop forum that they had uh, a couple of months ago. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna get this next presentation up and we'll jump right in. Okay, um, so hopefully um, most of you were able to attend the public workshop from back in June. Um, the idea today is to um, hone in on the shoreline and sea level rise components. Um, a lot of the presentation slides are actually just about all of them, minus a few um, added text points are, are similar slides, but I've um, truncated them just to be uh, specific to shoreline. And so you won't see any of the um, hillside or, or wildfire strategies, but um, um, I've got a handful of slides. Um, hopefully you all are um, somewhat familiar and then um, feel free to stop me at any point and ask questions. Um, but the goal is to really um, dive into those um, you know, coastline and shoreline strategies further. So this is kind of the overall timeline. Um, this effort has been going on since really fall of 2018. Um, we're here in, in kind of what I would call the, the finishing stretch. Um, the goal is to finalize the document, you know, by say end of January, end of February. So um, we're really trying to um, get everyone's feedback and, and um, compile it together and have one kind of concise, um, succinct uh, document that's adopted by council. So on the overall um, climate adaptation plan, um, these are the main focus areas. Uh, these areas in kind of the uh, um, pinkish color are your hillside strategies. We won't be going into those. Those are primarily um, fire and evacuation route um, strategies. Um, here, this one in, in yellow that, that is most of Madera Gardens, but really extends beyond that is a look at our overall flood control network. And um, we included in our uh, most re recent um, CIP budget uh, a line item to do a storm drain master plan update, which would also include considering um, changes in climate. So they're projecting more intense rainfall, um, and therefore we want to make sure that our uh, detention basins and um, pump stations are, are able to handle that. And if not, um, that'll address it and we can um, make it part of our work plan. So that'll be kicked off um, this fiscal year and it'll probably be a, a multi-year effort. It's um, you know almost as big as the, the cap in the sense of all the um, effort that's gonna go into it. So um, stay tuned for that. Um, otherwise, um, today what I wanna dive into are these green and purple areas. Um, so green, we have Lucky Drive and Paradise Drive. Um, those really refer to uh, what I'm calling near-term strategies. And they're near-term more so, I would say, because of um, the level of funding and also the amount of environmental um, 
complications. So those are projects that if we had funds tomorrow, I think could be delivered um, in less than five years. So um, we'll spend some time on there and then we'll dive into the, the bigger challenge, which is, um, you know, how to, how to safeguard uh, our two subdivisions, Marina, Vig Marina Village and Mariner Cove, as well as our um, marsh frontage. Um, before I move to the next slide, one thing I do want to touch on is you'll see, can you see my cursor? Yes. So you'll see this zone here. Um, you know, this is the extension of the old rail. Um, in board of that is the um, kind of industrial zone of Larkspur. Um, the, un the smart right of way is still um, the primary um, land rights there, but underlying that is County of Marin, unincorporated. And then actually out here to the east is um, within County Court of Jurisdiction. Um, now, my position would be that um, it's really for Larkspur and or county to kind of fund this portion of um, protection. And, and we've reached out to them and, and kind of started discussing ways to partner with them and, and combine efforts. Um, I'm not saying we would leave them behind, but, um, you know, because these uh, strategies are very expensive, um, you know, we have to be smart with what is considered our responsibility and what is not. So that's, um, that's been relayed to them. They're, they have an opportunity to, to comment on that, but um, that's been my kind of take on this um, from looking at it in a little more detail. Um, on the broader climate adaptation plan, you know, these are the five areas that we're um, really focused on, but today we're, we're really going to focus on sea level rise. Um, doesn't mean like that these other things aren't being studied and aren't important, but um, really I want to use the uh, knowledge and resources we have on this board to really dive into sea level. So coastal challenges and strategies. So the red line represents um, the old smart, well I guess um, it was under a different name, but that's the railroad corridor there in red. And here it is in 2019. So as you can see, quite a lot of development in uh, low-lying marshlands, and hence why we're uh, uh, vulnerable to these um, rises in, in tides. <clears throat> um, here's a shot of some of the elevations of Marina Village, Mariner Cove. Um, as you can see, some low-lying areas in Marina Village uh, that was built as a, a <clears throat> A low fill or a, a, a blanking on the exact term. The it was built at a lower elevation, but with protection through a um, detention basin and levee. And then Mariner Cove was built at a higher elevation, but does not have um, a system of that nature in place. Um, both have unique challenges. Both are vulnerable, and so um, this cap is really uh, designed to come up with some ideas and, and start that conversation. And really try to. Um, work towards some implementable strategies. So here's a photo from 2015 of a king tide. Um, 7.4 feet is, is kind of your con common king tide right now and in 2040 that's um, projected to be the kind of average or normal high tide. So um, just something to really consider that's that's going to really increase the frequency we see um, those levels of inundation. Here's, um, <clears throat> here's a map of, of the plus three foot scenario. So really this is um, you know, definitely what we want to avoid. So um, we're really going to try to come up with some ideas to, to get in front of this before this occurs, but um, this is where a lot of our um, infrastructure starts to have significant issues. And so, um, you know, as you can see from the depths, um, it's hard to tell with the various colors, but um, yeah, we really need to act now and, and, and really, um, you know, carry this momentum forward into some real um, implementable um, design options. 
Uh, taking a step back, this is a view of that same plus three foot scenario, town wide. Um, so yeah, without this levee system here along the, the smart track, um, our malls, 101, um, all, many other areas are, are gonna be um, you know, vulnerable. So this is the guidance from um, the California State Assembly. Um, this recommendation to uh, account for um, three and a half feet as a goal is, I would say, more conservative than a lot of the other projections. Um, but I still think it's better to be safe than sorry, so we'll be using that as a, a goal. Oh, let me back up for a second. And, and that three and a half feet is really, um, think of it as um, elevation of water rising in a bathtub. It, it doesn't um, fully account for um, wave velocities and wave run up and other things and, and higher storms. So all other factors to consider um, depending on, you know, where you are in, um, in relation to those flows. Another thing, um, you know, obviously, uh, when we think of raising levees and berms and building walls, um, you know, that's, that's definitely a, a big part of, of how we look at water elevations. But, um, you know, most of our grounds are permeable to some degree. And so, you know, we also have to realize that at a certain point, you know, um, you know, even if the wall is high enough, you're going to have other issues that um, occur with groundwater seeping through and, um, whether that be, you know, your um, crawl space is constantly wet or, or whether our, um, you know, sewer pipes and storm drains are, are constantly inundated. There's, there's a number of other things that um, we need to keep into account. And, and those are, um, you know, and a lot of those things are, are not, haven't been well studied. So, um, you know, we're just going to have to continue to keep our ears open and, and do the best we can and, and kind of, taking the tech, the information as, um, as this experience is around the nation. Um, here are some general um, repair options that um, are commonly used. <clears throat> this is one that's um, being uh, used in Foster City, which um, could apply to a lot of our um, a lot of our zones where you have a, a levee that's also combined with a sheet pile wall <clears throat> and the sheet pile would help with some of that groundwater. Um, even those do um, leak a little bit, but definitely um, uh, much less than just an earthen berm by itself. Um, here's another concept where um, this ecotone slope idea is come into play. And when we say ecotone slope, I'm referring to the portion that's this side of the, the berm there. Um, it allows uh, the environment and the habitat to migrate, you know, with, um, with the rising tides, you know, on, on a simple level, it, you know, we might be talking about a, an inch a year. And so, um, you know, that's enough for habitat to kind of um, work its way up. And so we're exploring this idea with um, the resource agencies and, and we have kind of some different opinions, but um, some look, some agencies are looking more long range such as Regional Water Quality Control Board and then others um, are a little more um, short range as such as um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So we're trying to try to get a consensus on, on what is the best, um, you know, concept to move forward with because there's kind of a, a different um, viewpoint in that. Um, so tide gates or storm surge barriers, um, these would be needed anywhere we, um, you know, cross a, a water channel. So, um, you know, that could come into play with, with some of these alternatives. And yeah, just going back to the, the two different sets of scenarios, <clears throat> I'm going to dive into the near term first, and then we'll get into the, the marsh strategies. So here's Lucky Drive. This is from December 2019. Uh, this is right in front of the town's 
courtyard. Um, in the distance there is um, Redwood High Redwood High School. So at this time, it was about 18 inches deep, you know, just enough for someone in an SUV to drive through. And you see some sedans, but I think they're taking a little risk there. Um, and that's, you know, so that's, that's a current event, you know, this is happening every year. And so um, I see this as a, an immediate need. Um, this is a main artery into, um, you know, Larkspur and, and inner parts of Marin. And, and so um, it's on our jurisdiction and for all the reasons of evacuation routes and, and other things, um, we want to try to keep this open. Um, because of that regional benefit, I think it has a, a good chance to um, compete for some grants and, and we've had some discussions with the county in Larkspur and um, they're, they're definitely uh, want to partner and, and come up with some strategies to try to get some, some grant funding and, and so we're going to continue to explore those. So this is just kind of that yellow circle here is, is where the photo is taken. Um, you've got the Big Five and SF Fitness. So as you exit 101, you're getting on Pfeiffer and then you're turning left and you got Redwood High School. Um, <clears throat> the portion over here is uh, County Marin. And so, you know, we've asked them, you know, if we do a project out here, or do they have interest in being involved to address any of their, <clears throat> you know, uh, low elevation areas and, and they're going to get back to us on that one. Um, this is our Black Kettle Detention Basin. Um, this takes water from the industrial parts of Larkspur and also parts of Pfeiffer. And it, it sends them here where they're then pumped out. Um, so we would have to account for that. Um, it is, however, it appears to be separate from the storm drain system that is on Lucky Drive, which for the most part actually goes to a pump station that we have out the courtyard and then out over here um, into this part of Puerto Madera Creek. Um, so that Lucky Drive project would involve raising the road and likely pump station upgrades um, to improve the, the time it would take to, to get that water out. Um, we're likely looking at a, a kind of the sweet spot right now would be um, kind of taking this, uh, where a pump station here is at, um, at um, the entrance of High Canal, it's at about 10 foot elevation and kind of trying to our best to carry that elevation all the way down at least to Pfeiffer um, is kind of the, the working theory right there. Um, as an added benefit, there's some opportunities for some multimodal improvements. Um, either some, there's one concept for some buffered class twos and there's also um, an option for a class four roadway. Um, I'm going to stop there before we move on. Do we want to, does anyone have any comment or feedback on this um, lucky drive strategy? RJ, I think uh, uh, that's a good strategy just to try to raise that road up. One of the things I've always wondered about is why Larkspur drains, you know, the commercial parts of Larkspur uh, east of 101 drained to the Black Kettle Lagoon rather than into the Shorebird Marsh where Larkspur also has a smaller pump station right next to ours. I know that would involve sort of re-engineering some things, but it does seem strange that uh, it has to come underneath the highway to get uh, pumped into uh, Corte de Madera Creek. Yeah, I, I can just take a logical guess at it, but um, I'm guessing Black Kettle Lagoon was kind of the nearest waterway at one point in time. And so they just piped under the freeway and went to there. And then eventually later that turned into a detention basin when they um, developed these homes and, and put fill and whatnot. I, I think you're probably correct because that, that was present prior to Shorebird Marsh uh, detention pond being developed and uh, run by Corte Madera. Okay, uh, I'm going to move on. Here so, RJ, what is the solution for Lucky Drive? Just to elevate it? Yeah. So, you know, again, um, you know, we've we've done some um, more more or less. I would call it advanced planning. Um, I wouldn't 
characterize it as engineering quite yet, but um, you know, we, we've we've looked at the maps, um, we've we've done some field analysis. We we know what we have, so it's raising the road, and then um, improving the pump station at the corp yard. Um, I don't know if the pipe, the underlying um, storm drain network, you know, those pipes are lacking capacity and need to be enlarged as well. That that could be possible, um, or if it's just simply the the pipe, the pumps that we have aren't aren't strong enough. Um, but a couple of things are happening. Um, it's, you know, water is, is either coming in through the, the ground or also surface and the pumps can't keep up. So, um, so yeah, by raising it, we're going to keep the water from, you know, flowing in from, a, you know, due to gravity and then making sure the pumps are um, adequate to handle what does make it in the storm drain system and pumping it out. Thank you. Yeah, so here's a here's another um, project. This is over by Paradise Drive, um, you know, between Westward and Robin Drive. Um, <clears throat> this one, to my knowledge, I don't know that it it overtops. Um, it may have on occasion, but I haven't seen it um, in the last couple of years. But um, it does range in the. I want to say. Um, six to 10 foot range elevation. And there are some existing berms that are on the bay side of the road. So perhaps that's why it's, it's we're not seeing those um, overtopped and into the roadway. Um, and, but this one is, has been kind of on the, on the work plan for multimodal improvements. And um, it's, it could be, warranted for, for repaving. And so before we, um, it had been um, on the CIP for those things. And I kind of stopped and said, you know, let's not invest in this pavement when we need to raise it, um, if it's going to be overtopping in the near future. And um, so now we've kind of added that to the design scope and, and we've actually repurposed the, the money we had from TAM, which was originally for multimodal improvements. And so now it'll be for multimodal improvements plus sea level rise. Um, you know, th there are some, um, as you can see by this um, kind of turquoise color, you know, there are some um, wetland ditches and some other things on the inside of the roadway. So that'll be, you know, environmental challenge that we'll have to get through with um, our compliance. Um, but at the same time, I don't see that as being a, um, you know, insurmountable, uh, challenge in the near in the near term, and then secondly, um, the other one is there's a overcrossing pedestrian overcrossing that's used by the schools, and um, so we've already let them know that you know if we raise the road, which we're likely to do, that they would have to start coming up with some ideas on how to um, raise that overcrossing accordingly to um, satisfy the the Caltrans um, requirements for clearance. Um, so we'll be working through those conversations with the, the two schools, um, but um, really um, those are the biggest two challenges and otherwise it's, it's kind of just bringing in earth and fill and, and bringing it up, you know, three to five. Yeah, so RJ, with this one, it, it's a bit different than the Lucky Drive in that this area is potentially part of a um, future continuous barrier that might exist connecting Paradise Drive all the way towards Larkspur Landing. And so if you make this decision to raise this roadway, you may be making a long-term decision to sacrifice that school property that's on the uh, opposite side, on the bay side. Um, of course, you could go back and, and build a new levee on the bay side of that facility, but it does seem like a long-term decision um, by raising the road. And having grown up over there, I've never seen water on that road. So I, I think it's definitely less of a priority than, than Lucky Drive. Um, it, it's going to make sense in the long run. I, I'm not sure I would put this at the top of your priority list. Yep. Yeah, fair point. And, and yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I can understand the optics and any intent isn't to, um, you know, 
it, it isn't to make that long-term decision. It's kind of, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll be able to convey this more once we get into some of the, the costs and whatnot. It's, um, it was really born out of, hey, we had this um, design funds ready to go to invest in a roadway. And, oh, wait, why are we investing in a roadway that within the, um, the service life could be inundated? Um, we've asked Tam if we could repurpose that money. I mean, I, I think if they were amenable, I probably would shift it over to Lucky Drive. But I think, um, I think that's going to be a challenge. Um, but I do agree if, um, if all things were equal, I would prioritize Lucky Drive because it's an immediate um, impediment, you know, in the, in the winter months and all those things. Yeah. And, and I think in the big picture, it would be good. We don't have to do it tonight, but for this group and for Department of Public Works to have some kind of philosophical um, agreement about what they think is going to happen perhaps long after we're all gone working on this site, um, even you young guys, um, about what's gonna be required. And if we do really believe that if sea level rises three, four or five feet, a continuous barrier would be required, that'd be the only way to save Quarter Madera and Larkspur. It would be good to know approximately where that's going to be or where our options are. And then when you're working towards the shortage solution, make sure they make sense with what might eventually be a long-term solution. So in other words, you might be doing something now that can be built on top of in the future and you can raise it in the future. So that's why I say, as you said, the optics, make it seem, make it seem like that the roadway is gonna be the line in the sand in the future. So I would agree with uh, Nate that I have not seen uh, that road uh, overtopped, but it is low. And so while Lucky might be a condition that's flooding now, this will be flooding in the not too distant future. If it was raised to 12 feet, that would, uh, and, and upgraded, uh, that would uh, uh, keep the area protected and the roadway clear, you know, for many decades uh, going forward. Uh, and then the issue of the overcrossing for the school you know, we've got two houses in, in Mariner Cove that are up on uh, jacks right now being raised. And so I would think that would be relatively easy to, uh, to raise that structure up also. RJ, I only wanted to ask whether you were going to widen the road at all as part of your plan, because you were speaking to the marshlands on the, um, not just the bay side, but the opposite side, and whether that was going to impact some of the ecological aspects over there. So if you were going to widen, how, how far would you be going? So um, this is essentially the, the, de the desired cross section through there. Um, there are, there is some widening in this zone, which is on the, the bay side. Um, you know, obviously I don't have the full um, concept, you know, line work, but um, this zone here, you know, you would look, you'd be looking at 10 or 12 feet where it's um, currently earthen, but the rest of it is within the current pavement. Um, but yeah, the desire would be, you know, something like this, um, you know, uh, head path on, on one side. And, and right now it's, it's, um, the feedback has been to put that on the, um, you know, the, the, the ring, or the, you know, <clears throat> the ring mountain side, and then you've got your, bike and pet facilities. And who's got the, do we have ownership of that property that you've got there in the purples? You know, um, yeah, so that one is within. Um, or right away? Down right away. Um, it's possible as we get into some of the uh, massaging of, of any um, drainage areas that we might temporarily enter into, um, uh, you know, some of the school lands or, or um, possibly even um, Marin County Parks, um, but it wouldn't be with a permanent structure of any sort. It would just be, you know, a little regrading and some replanting. And so um, we think once we have more information, those are conversations that um, we can work through. <clears throat> okay, if we're uh, ready, I'll move on to the the bigger challenges. 
Do we have any questions uh, from other board members or from our audience? Uh, Chairman Bundy, it's Phil Carroll and I joined a little bit late. I was given one of the links to the public access. So I listened in for the first 15 minutes via the public and then now I'm on the board side. Okay, very good. Yeah. I don't see any raised hands. Um, so I'm going to please proceed. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so these are um, some of the, the specific known and named marshes. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not an expert in these. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, improve my, my knowledge of the specific areas, but, you know, obviously the, they're all important and we want to, um, you know, uh, keep them as, as long as we possibly can and do whatever we can to, um, you know, help them through our different options. Um, this portion along the old rail track is, is a smart right away. It's pretty wide. It's about 150 feet. It goes down all the way to um, the intersection of San Clemente and Redwood Highway. Beyond that, this portion is Cord Madera. And then we have the levee that wraps around the Marina Village levee. And then we have this whole zone is um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, here are a couple projects that are um, either completed or in the works. So here on the left side, um, this is a project that was done by Marin Audubon Society. This is at the end of Industrial Way. So uh, Industrial Way is, is just north of Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's would be about down here somewhere. Um, they actually were, you know, doing a project, I believe, focused around, you know, improving um, Ridgeway rail habitat and and in the process um, if you've seen it they, they installed a bunch of raised earthen mounds which actually will, will help us all with sea level rise so um, I think in that and whether it was done um, you know purposeful or not I, th I think they've saved us this segment um, with that higher elevation <clears throat> uh, this is another project the Golden Gate Bridge District is about to start um, this is Shorebird Marsh. Further down would be the gravel lot. This is our Shorebird Marsh pump station. Um, so they'll be moving soil around, doing plantings, trying to make this a, a better, um, higher functioning ecological area. Um, this is depicted this way. They actually have, um, plans to do a, a more six significant mitigation project. Um, so I, I, I don't know exactly where the design is, what level of design, but I know, you know, they, they have intentions to do that as part of the various um, bridge district projects. This is kind of one of their primary mitigation sites. So really one of the bigger challenges that um, we're, we're working through and, and we recently had a meeting with SMART and we'll be following up and, and having several other meetings is um, they have verbalized that they want to leave it open to one day moving the smart train down here. So they've indicated they, they may have a station at one day in the future and um, going down to the malls. And where that creates challenges is, you know, obviously building a berm or a levee um, that can just handle the weight of pedestrians and cyclists is, is a lot different than having a berm that's built to hold a, a train track. Um, and then also you've got the, you know, there's specific horizontal clearance requirements. Obviously you don't want people and wildlife right next to a train track. So we're, we're kind of working through um, some of those issues, but that's, that's one of the bigger challenges with this segment here. <clears throat> is there, that's an opportunity, RJ, right? If they were to want to, bring that train all the way down to our shopping center, they'd have to pay for those improvements to some extent, right? Um, so they have the right-of-way. Um, 
and and we would want to discuss you know hey look if we are um raising it you know and it could hold your train then that's a benefit right you wouldn't want to be build a train track that's in a low-lying area um and it's a little bit of a catch i just don't know that they're going to i think it's unlikely they're going to pony up money for a project that they're not sure if they're going to build and if they build it it could be 50 or 100 years from now so but at the same time they're not willing to give up that dream so it's it's definitely a uh a complication and, and yeah we're, we're working through it so um but so yeah here are the various alternatives we're going to try to narrow these down as we kind of conclude or kind of work toward a adopted document um and, and kind of part of that will be the a little bit of a preliminary environmental um you know constraints um, exercise as well as looking at some the, the engineering costs for these various strategies. I mean, obviously we, you know, we don't want to, the, the more we can narrow it down, it's going to set us up um, to kind of move forward toward a grant application or into um, environmental compliance and design. So we're, we're trying to work through these, but um, so you can put a berm on, on one side or the other of the tracks that, you know, doesn't accommodate for train. You could have a, a widened berm that accommodates for a train and potentially um, some access to bike and peds. Um, so yeah, full height levy base side of the existing railroad berm without bike and peds. And then same thing, widened raised bike berm with, with bike ped access only. Um, so that doesn't quite narrow it down and I think it'd be good to dive into it a little bit and I'm going to switch to Google Earth um, for a little discussion here. You guys still see my screen here? Yeah. Okay. So I've been, you know, kind of walking this zone <clears throat> and here, um, you know, under the assumption that they may go as far south as here at this gravel lot. Um, this segment seems pretty straightforward. I think we would try to build something outside of the marsh completely. And so we would hold this edge here as kind of our, um, you know, the closest point that we would get to the marsh and then build our levee improvements toward the roadway. And, and whether that means that there's a wall here, so the path isn't elevated, or whether it means we elevate the path as part of that levee system, you know, that's that's obviously open for discussion, but um, just this segment, if we, if we were to proceed with that, would be a fairly straightforward project. Um, doesn't mean it wouldn't have costs associated, but from an environmental standpoint, from a land rights standpoint, um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so as we move this way, yeah, now we get into smart, but we're getting into a zone and then we have Golden Gate Bridge District over here. We're getting into smart territory, but <clears throat> perhaps a different conversation because they may not have any plans to go further south than here. So maybe they're more amenable to um, this being built up and not accommodating rail, you know, the train tracks. Um, so that doesn't seem as challenging. That's, you know, still within the realm of, okay, I think we can get through this. And then once we get to, you know, where we think they've, they've kind of indicated where that last station would be, if, it, if there was one, I guess that's, you know, really where it gets complicated where, yeah, do you build that super levy that can handle a, a smart rail or a smart track? <clears throat> do you look at, you know, they've already, they've already, Golden Gate Bridge District has already committed to a, a big mitigation project, so they're not going to want us to go right through what they plan to build here in the next couple years. Um, do you go this side and try to, um, you know, improve this, do enough improvements, you know, habitat-wise to make this a, a benefit, and then 
there's going to be a slight reduction in capacity to where we, you know, maybe have some, you know, we improve the volume by some strategic dredging and whatnot. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we are. And then again, uh, I think I mentioned it, this is a zone that we're going to look at and, and talk about with Larkspur and County and, and other folks. Um, but again, because this is all Larkspur and this is underlying county, um, we're kind of taking the, at least I'm taking the position that that's um, an improvement that, that those agencies should fund. So I'll maybe open up for questions first if, um, if anyone wants to dive in here. RJ, a minute ago you showed that graphic of Golden Gate Bridge District that's at the bottom of the screen right there. Um, and you showed that it was going to be right there. The key says restored marsh. Um, so is that entire light green area going to be underwater during high tide? Is that the plan? Um, I don't think so, no. Um, <clears throat> so let's see here. RJ, yep. uh, I was involved with Marin Audubon in discussions about that whole Golden Gate Bridge District property, and they were going to try to convert that all to wetlands, so it, it would be affected by the tide, with the exception of the, the natural berm that's on the west side of it, which is next to the railroad right of way. And uh, they were trying to get mitigation credits for future projects, although they only needed you know, four or five acres at this point, they were gonna put that in a mitigation bank for future ferry projects. And they seem to have changed their mind and just gone for this much smaller mitigation project that I guess covers the credits that they need. And I don't know if it was objection from uh, walkers, dog walkers, hikers, that wanted to be able to have a continuous path around there and not have that pathway interrupted, that access interrupted, that caused them just to back away from that major project. But I, I and I don't know that there is a thought to doing uh, more on the major bowl at this point. Yeah, and I think um, what you know or, or just stated is, is consistent with what I've heard. Um, it sounded like they were, you know, inclined to move forward with the larger project if they were allowed to bank those credits. Um, but it sounds like they they weren't given that, um, you know, they, they weren't given that promise, and so um, they basically some portion of that project, that larger project, would have just been for, um, you know, some uh, feel good. Um, overall bends, but no, no mitigation credit. So I think that's why they reduced it to just fit um, what they needed for mitigation at this time. And then just the other piece about mitigation is um, generally, if you impact wetlands, you have to <clears throat> mitigate with wetlands at a higher ratio, whether it's two to one, three to one, or four to one. You couldn't necessarily go um, impact wetlands and then do some other form of mitigation, like removing fill from the bay. You know, they, they want it the same type, like for like. Mm -hmm. So that's another challenge as you look at the various types of projects and, and development. I, RJ, I know in uh, negotiations with Marin Audubon, the requirement that Marin Audubon put on them and that they agreed to was they could only use these mitigation credits from the larger project for Golden Gate Bridge District projects and they couldn't sell them to somebody else and they had agreed to that uh, so uh, you know I'm not sure if it was just the cost of doing a bigger project or the idea that they would have to put a bridge in to allow people to continue to circumnavigate uh, that bowl uh, but anyway, for whatever reason, they backed away from this larger project and they, they had some tentative plans on it and went to this smaller project. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bob. The, the reason I asked is because I've always seen that property, which was, I, I think, dredged from the ferry terminal or somewhere else in place there years ago as a source of per perhaps a whole bunch of free fill that Cordomadera could use for a berm in the future. And my impression is that land is 
um, high enough that it wouldn't be inundated even if they broke the berm right now. So they would have to actually remove some or a lot of material to have that area be flooded. And I, I would hope that we would be first in line to take that material if it was usable, but it sounds like it's not gonna be anytime soon. I believe that's correct. And I looked at it the same way, a great opportunity to create some valuable wetlands and some material for flood protection along the existing levee. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> Yeah, and to that point, um, yeah, it's, you know, from what we've understood, you know, those were historically areas where um, dredge spoils were placed. And so um, that probably would be um, suitable material for a thing such as a levee. And um, generally speaking, you, you do try to, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, pull your resources from what's nearby and, and given our proximity, you know, it sounds like we, we should be first in line or, or near, near, near a tour, you know, near the very front, especially if we're ready to go. So um, yeah, we, we've reached out to the Golden Gate Bridge District. We're, we're trying to have some of those discussions, see where we can, um, you know, find some win-win opportunities where we can uh, perhaps take some soil from them as part of a future project and at the same time save them the effort of moving it elsewhere at a higher cost. Um, so absolutely want to um, look into all those opportunities. The, the other comment I wanted to make was that uh, the, the berm on the western side of the bowl, which is considerably higher uh, than the railroad right away, you know, would be an excellent uh, levy for us to tie into. And then we would just have to work on the railroad right away that extends from the northern end of the Golden Gate property uh, where they're doing the mitigation uh, right at that junction just below there and then continue that all the way up to Shorebird Marsh and beyond to have protection and to uh, be able to try to raise it on the western side as you were talking about on the uh, lower section. So Bob maybe um, walk me through it so I, I know what you're so when you refer to the, the bull which zone is that? Uh, the, the major bowl with the levee all around it, but it's really just at the uh, junction where we see the Golden Gate Bridge District is going to do their uh, uh, project. So just a little uh, south of there from your cursor, right there at that junction, that uh, is where the levee becomes high uh, right on the western edge of the bowl, and the railroad right away would need to be built up to uh, act as a functioning uh, uh, flood levy. Mm -hmm. Great. So from that spot going north up past the Shorebird pump station and on to industrial. Mm -hmm. So um, did I hear, so you, you think there's, um, this is a good alternative to look further into this build it on the western side, is that what I heard? Yes. Yeah, yeah great. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, and that was, um, so that was one of the minor um, changes. That, that wasn't fully considered when we went to um, the June workshop, but I, I, I kind of came to a similar conclusion over the last couple of months, and so I, I've asked our team to incorporate that. Um, so, um, glad to hear that you think it's worth, um, analyzing further as well. Yes. Cause the, the whole area of the Golden Gate Bridge District Bowl on the Western side has a raised elevation to it, uh, that mm -hmm. then ties into the levee that we want to raise, uh, on the Southern part, uh, of the railroad right away. Mm-hmm. And again, I think, uh, you know, most people that look at uh, SMART and the, the issues that they have and the cost of going across Corte Madera Creek and uh, Sir Francis Drake to get to one final stop village, I, I don't think anybody really thinks that's going to be feasible in the next millennium. Uh, yeah. It's just, uh, I, I don't think uh, really going to uh, be something that they're going to do, but they're going to they're going to hold on to the property and either 
you know, hold our feet to the fire or uh, not do anything on their part to uh, contribute to it. And so I think it's all going to be on Corte Madera and grant money to try to do some things to protect us. Yep. Great. Um, do we want to spend any more time on the Marsh strategies? Um, we have a separate um, conversation about Marina Village, Mariner Cove that um, is next. Any questions from our audience? Just one or quick point members? about that alignment that we've just been discussing is that that would work fine now at current sea levels because water could flow through floodgates from the bay into seabird marsh or shorebird marsh. But as sea level increases, it's going to become a cutoff marsh and it will probably no longer be feasible because you would have to essentially pump all the water out twice a day at the tides. Um, so at least in the long term, we might want to consider an alignment that keeps that marsh on the bay side because otherwise we might threaten losing it, which would be a real problem as far as um, permits go. No, I, my, my intention was to leave the Bayside Marsh, you know, as it is. There'll be a little bit of fill along the railroad right away as you build it up, but not to significantly impact the Shorebird Marsh, you know, which they flush on a regular basis. Right. I just mean it would be unflushable as sea level gets higher. I don't know. Yeah. RJ? Um, yeah, I mean, I see, I see the point there, um, and it's, it's worth considering. I think um, the reality is it's, it's very possible that any of these alternatives might require significant upgrades to Shorebird Marsh Pump Station or a complete rebuild anyway. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think it may will be more driven by um, the costs and um, you know, if, if we had, you know, if the only thing holding us back was rebuilding the pump station and a shifted alignment, um, that wouldn't be the worst thing. But again, we won't know until we, we really dive into the environmental impacts and, and the overall cost of the, the full system. So, but, but I see your point. I, I know what you're saying. Yeah, I think that's down the road, but I think it's just an important decision that you guys will have to make at some point on exactly where to align that one. Yeah, so um, really um, with all of these um, longer term strategies, I, I think the goal would be to either self-fund or better off try to get grant funds to start the next step. So, you know, if the next step is, um, you know, commonly it's, uh, they call it, project approval environmental document. So it's, um, you know, advanced planning to where you have enough engineering involved to where you can prepare a, a robust environmental document. Um, so that would be, you know, something we'd try to um, initiate here in the short term. So it doesn't mean we're, we're these are projects that are long term and we're just not going to do anything. It just means that they're going to take longer to, to implement and we still have to start now. Um, but it's going to be more of a slower step-by-step -step, um, with a lot of, you know, public involvement, environmental compliance, back and forth. Um, whereas the other ones, uh, that's just a compressed, uh, the short-term ones is just a very much compressed um, schedule. Those, those things still happen. They just happen a lot more rapidly. Okay. Um, shall I move on? Yes. Okay, so um, yeah, here we're going to talk um, more about Marina Village, Marina Cove. <clears throat> so yeah, here's that plus three foot scenario. Um, under this scenario, we're, we're kind of assuming this levee here that protects Marina Village is overtopped. Um, we believe that levee is about nine feet right now. Um, so if you add a 7.4 foot king tide and you add three feet, then, you know, then that that exceeds nine. You're, you're not sharing, sure, RJ. Oh, sorry. I, my apologies. All right. Um, 
so yeah, as I was saying, this levy here, this is the Marina Village levy. Um, for the most part, it's, you know, I would say safe to assume it's about nine feet elevation. And um, on the prior slide and, and from it, you know, those who follow tides and king tides, you know, 7.4 is, is kind of a um, something you would expect, you know, at least a couple times a year. And so if you add 7.4 plus a three foot rise, you're now, you know, 10.4, which is higher than this levy can protect. So um, that plus the, the screenshot we, we showed earlier about some of the elevations of um, parts of Mariner Cove, you know, this is definitely an area we want to um, really move on and come up with some, some plans here. So um, it's, it's not going to be easy. Um, you know, we're definitely um, fully engaged and want to do everything we can. Um, but it, it's going to be a, a, a tricky um, <clears throat> problem to problem to solve. So um, definitely want all your uh, all your feedback, all your input on this one. So um, you know, really, we we developed two alignments. One we're calling inner and outer alignment. Um, you know, and one one thing we heard from the public at the June meeting was, you know, they don't want us to do nothing. Um, and that sounds like a simple, simple thing, um, but it's also important, you know, that, um, that that was kind of the consensus at that time. Um, you know, obviously we haven't presented costs and, and what that does to, you know, various town budgets, but, um, you know, we, we did want to kind of formalize that. So this is the inner alignment and it's inner because it kind of hugs the um, you know property line and often in some places I think I think it's going to be in, in some backyards and whatnot. Um, you'll see this levee here the marine village levee gets shifted in and that would be considered uh, an improvement to the environment so that's making it closer to the homes. Um, these are kind of supplemental features that um, may or may not happen as part of uh, a this project, but they're definitely considered um, benefits to the surrounding environment. So this is, this idea is just these mounds that um, birds and other habitat could retreat to in, in times of higher tides. Here's a coarse beach that um, kind of is a hardier slope um, than just kind of the, the current earthen marsh edge. So it can kind of handle some of that wave velocity um, and then, yeah, ecotone slope is that um, real gentle slope to allow, uh, you know, the various um, habitat to migrate with the rising tide. <clears throat> so this is um, taking a cross section right through here as an example. So that's an example of what the levee might look like. Again, um, you know, one of the downsides is it, it does have a tendency to impact views, which, you know, I think uh, many people that live there, you know, that's probably one of the reasons why they, they chose that. So, um, you know, there's certainly some trade-offs that um, we're all gonna have to balance and, and kind of work through. You wanna, Zoom in at this at all before I move on to the next one. Oops. Yeah, one of the uh, thoughts that I had, David Bell and I had walked that, and uh, most of the residents don't really have views because of, for privacy reasons, they have uh, six foot fences uh, on the back of their property. And uh, the uh, the level of the pathway is, is uh, even below that. Uh, but one of the concerns I had is if there is a levee that people are walking on and it's close to the houses like that, then that really impacts their privacy as well as potential views if they didn't have a fence. But privacy might be a greater concern as it seems to be for them now with the fences. And is it possible to put a fence, privacy fence on the uh, levee, on the uh, <clears throat> south side of the levee so that the the homes have 
have their continued privacy as they do now with the existing fences. Um, is that a, <clears throat> something that could feasibly be done? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely feasible. Um, you just would be having more of a, uh, you know, a, a, a higher privacy screen of, of, of the view above the levee. But um, again, um, you know, we're open to, you know, if, if this is the direction we go, then, you know, we'd be open to, you know, what the public is um, prefer, you know, prefers on, on something like that. I think it's worth looking at the Santa Venetia neighborhood um, on the north side of China Camp, which is almost like a, a mirror image if you flipped over East Corte Madera, over, over China Camp, it looks just like it. And they already have a levee like this, but it's not public access. So when you look out your back window, you see the levee, you don't have a view, but it's your levee and you can climb up there and put some chairs up there and have a great view yourself, but people aren't walking that levee. So the question of access is, is moot there. Um, it would just be whether or not we would want to build a levee like that and not let people walk it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and um, what's not shown here is just kind of an approximated, you know, um, property line. Um, so as part of any environmental document, you know, there's an analysis where is this, you know, the best location for the environment and and that, I don't, you know, really doesn't take a whole lot in account about, you know, private versus public. So um, I, I don't have the answer, but, you know, to say, hey, put put this, protect my house and, and put it 100% um, in the marsh, um, that, that may not be an acceptable result. So there, there would be, you know, potentially some trade-off and, and conversations when you when we get into it, if, if we're going to build these systems, hey, you know, there's going to be perhaps an encroachment, but your house is protected and, you know, that's the, you know, that's the benefit you get out of, out of this. Well, Nathan's, Nathan's thought about having it just as a uh, no access to the public uh, levy uh, would uh, certainly be preferable probably to the residents that are there. Uh, the community would still have access to the levy uh, from say uh, uh, channel uh, and, uh, and going out along the levee so they could uh, walk out to the mouth of San Clemente Creek from there. Uh, and currently there's only a, a, you know, a rough path behind the fences most of the people are walking further out on what you're showing here is the former levy. Great. Okay, I'm gonna move on to Mariner Cove. So here's, a, here's another similar diagram with a cross section just um, on the Mariner Cove side. Um, I think one of the key differences here is um, the slope is, is steeper. You have kind of, I think, deeper waters right immediate to where you would be putting that particular um, cross section here, right? You're quickly into the bay. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why this um, sheet pile is, is shown there and, and why it's it may not appear, but it's it's, it's more of a steeper slope than the previous version. <clears throat> and um, in case it, I'll, I'll, this, um, it, it's also important to have kind of that earth really on both sides. It doesn't have to meet it exactly, but um, just think of kind of a, I don't know, uh, a ruler or some sort in the ground, you know, if, if it's not support on both sides, it's gonna, it's gonna flex. So, um, you know, there, there, there has to be, you know, the, the less earth you have on both sides, um, the more it's gonna wanna flex and, and move around. So, and this would be a levee that uh, would not be accessible for just hikers or walkers. This would be, in Nathan's example of Santa Venetia, with uh, you've got a levee in your backyard, you can walk up there and, you know, enjoy the view. 
<clears throat> yeah, and I, I think aspects of that, you know, I think, um, I know, you know, I, I don't, I don't have a strong preference, so we, we would want to um, do what makes sense for the community in those regards, so. And I think the, the sheet pile idea, if it's driven interlocking sheet pile that goes down into the mud a ways, will go a long way to stopping the groundwater flow as well, because if you get down 10 or 15 feet, there's not going to be very much groundwater moving through those tight sediments. So um, that could be a huge help for the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. The key is, yeah, having it penetrate into the bay mud. Okay, um, so we move on to the outer alignment. Um, slightly different pr approach. Um, you know, this is California Department of Fish and Wildlife land. Um, so obviously we would need um, all of their permissions. We would, we would need their permissions either way, but especially on their property, we would need their permissions. Um, but it would be raising and building up this historic levy um, so that it's, you know, away from the private properties to an extent. And then it'd be a, you know, likely expensive tidal um, surge barrier. Um, I think the one that was built at Belmer and Keys might be the, the closest example in the area. Um, the downside, obviously, that would make this um, a, a lesser, um, lesser quality environment for, for habitat and other things. Um, it wouldn't change kind of the options here on this side, given the, you know, can't go much further out into the bay to build a structure. So um, we'd have to bring it back at some point. But that, that's kind of the, the outer alignment option here. Um, one other quick note is that as the sea level rises, um, eventually that tide gate will have to be closed all the time and we'll just have to pump the water out from the creek. So that'll be an expensive mm -hmm. uh, item later on. Well, I think for the uh, sort of foreseeable future, just having the ability to close it only at, uh, you know, the very high tides that would cause flooding and I'm sure you would have to close it early enough that there would be uh, some reservoir back behind it for rainwater. Uh, but the, the need for a pump could be sort of much further in the, uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. And I think the habitat would uh, continue to be good quality uh, habitat until you got to the point where it was being closed off a significant part of the time. But that again, you know, could be very far in the future. Mm -hmm. um, something worth noting, um, this portion, it, it may, um, there still may be a benefit um, to, to shift this into the homes. Um, right now you have kind of what they call bisecting habitats. You have a habitat here that's cut in half or separated by a, a levee system and another. So um, there may be a, advantage to shift this in as this project happens, if it were to happen, and then maybe that provides some um, some mitigation by, by doing that. So RJ, one of the other things I thought in relationship to this project would be the uh, levy, uh, the old levy that is going out on the uh, north side that we're going to sort of abandon. Um, the you know, rather than having these uh, raised areas uh, within the uh, uh, Marta's Marsh that you show, we could excavate that uh, outer levee, uh, but leave several uh, upland refugia areas there, and then be able to use some of that material to uh, uh, build up the levees that uh, we need to raise. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Um, you're talking about here, um, taking some of this levy oh, and well, you know, yeah, yeah. I, if you were going to move that levy inland, but I'm saying uh, east of there, as you yeah. go out uh, towards the bay, on mm -hmm. the levy to the uh, north of that, mm -hmm. 
That one, yeah. You know, just uh, re, you know, excavate some of that material and leave some that's upland. And so you're doing some mitigation, you're creating more wetlands uh, where there's uh, just an upland uh, levee right now, even though it's washing out towards the uh, bay. Yeah. Yeah, it'll, it'll be, you know, obviously we, we've had some very surface level conversations. It'll be interesting how they evolve because, you know, there's, there's the kind of purist um, standpoint of, you know, do the minimum, touch the minimum, disturb the minimum. And then there's others that see, um, you know, regrading this as a long-term benefit and look, look at it through that lens. So, um, but yeah, you know, point, point received in that um, it's possible that there is a balance that it is long-term a benefit and that that's part of the, the project. Okay, so here is kind of a side-by-side -side, um, kind of high-level pros and cons of kind of these two options. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, I, I don't know that... Um, as part of the cap, we're gonna, you know, go outright and, and pick one completely, but I think, you know, there is some benefit to um, kind of leaning toward one direction or other or, or, or putting on a preference. I think really to fully make that decision, I, I think there needs to be a more detailed environmental analysis, cost analysis, which probably is beyond the scope of the cap, but, you know, kind of based on, you know, what you've seen today, um, do you have a, you know, an inclination between these two options? So RJ, one thing I would probably add to this table, by the way, the whole analysis was great. I've been noodling in Google Earth forever on that area and came up with the same ideas as you guys did. Um, you have in the outer alignment, the first item preserves the neighborhood status quo. And that's true because everybody still has their waterfront. It still looks the same. They can still get to their docks. But as sea level rises, as we discussed, uh, a tide gate would have to be permanently closed. So in the future, it would not preserve the status quo. But if you had a berm or um, something right on people's property line in their backyards, once again, like Santa Venetia, people there just have a staircase that goes up the levee and down the other side, and they have their docks on the other side of the levee. So in the long term, actually the inner alignment is the one that preserves the status quo, and it preserves the incredible value of having waterfront bay access to those houses. So I just think we should consider that maybe only two or three feet of sea level rise um, would be enough to, to ruin bay access unless you have the inner alignment. Well, I, I think I favor the uh, the outer alignment from the standpoint that I think it would be very difficult to uh, uh, do that seawall along all of the uh, homes that are bordering uh, San Clemente Creek, that that would have potentially more impact on the environment than just having a tide gate uh, for the foreseeable future. Although I get your point that, you know, if the projections are correct, 100 years from now, this is going to be potentially closed uh, most of the time. And, you know, you'd have to have a, uh, a pump uh, in there to do that. On the outer alignment, I sort of were, uh, wasn't uh, clear on how it's more likely to impact uh, Marta's Marsh. Um, yeah, I think that's... Um... Yeah, that's, that's a great question, probably for our SFEI team, but I think really just because you're taking what's kind of been a, a, a levy that's been degraded into kind of more of a naturalized environment, and then you're bringing it back into this engineered berm again, um, that presumably would get wider in footprint, you know, as you build it up. 
But uh, ultimately, if we don't do something like this, especially the hardening of the outer edge of the marsh, you know, we're going to see these marshes erode as, as we notice on Google Earth as uh, the soft outer earthen berm just erodes away from uh, sea level rise and storm surges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you know, perhaps that's part of the mitigation is to do something like that. One other potential mitigation would be even to uh, put this hardened berm further out and uh, potentially put dredge spoils on the inner side of that to build up wetlands as uh, one you know, future way of maintaining and improving our wetlands. Just because they're, you know, the mud flats really gradually go out from there for a long distance. Mm -hmm. And along those lines, Bob, um, Chris Chu with the county has studied that and actually done work on that, I think up in Santa Fe by the, uh, the creek that comes out past the marinas there where you can build some engineered structures out in the bay that would redirect the water during the winter coming out of Puerto Madera Creek and force that water closer to the shore where it can drop all of its sediment. Um, so you, you could use nature to redirect some of that Puerto Madera Creek sediment closer to our marshes and help reduce erosion. Yeah, I, I think that uh, that's the same concept uh, here in that if you could build it out further, you know, the uh, tides would come in past it carrying sediment and then going out slowly uh, would be somewhat obstructed uh, by the uh, hard barrier and would drop some of that sediment and hopefully allow the uh, marsh to accrete uh, and grow. Okay. And um, so that's the, the kind of end of the focus portion on Marina Village, Mariner Cove. Um, you know, I kind of touched on it already. There's, there's various short-term, long-term strategies. Um, you know, at a certain point, um, you know, if, if the projections are right, you know, and heard all sorts of them, you know, even some of these strategies, you know, and they might just be buying us time as opposed to being a, um, you know, uh, you know, ultimate solution. So um, as we develop things, we'll develop, you know, what we can over a reasonable time period to implement those. And then as time progresses, we'll have to come up with kind of what's the, what's the next step and, and at what point in time, you know, what trigger happens, what elevation that gets hit, do we start looking toward, you know, the next phase. Um, so that'll be part of this ongoing effort of um, trying to safeguard our community. So RJ, that was great. You discussed everything from Paradise Drive down by Marine Country Day School to Mariner Cove to the bike path by CHP, um, all the way down into Larkspur. But then what about Puerto Madera Creek? And that goes back to what I alluded to before. Do we feel from an engineering perspective that given a certain level of sea level rise, there's nothing to do but close Puerto Madera Creek. <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, obviously we, we spent some time on Lucky Drive, um, looking at that part of it. Um, you know, I'm not as, you know, I, I don't know if we would, you know, it's unlikely we would probably be the lead on that. That would probably be, um, you know, we would look to the, the county in Larkspur, and I think they've already kind of come up with some ideas and maybe have published some studies and whatnot. Um, ICS is probably a, um, a lesser role, you know, or at least not the lead role on those, um, given we have less of our town that's, that's taking the initial uh, wave of those um, rising tides, but definitely um, as things get developed, we want to you know, be involved and, and, and make sure we're, we're taking care of our, our community. So, um, but, you know, there's, yeah, I think you'd, you'd be looking at the portion, <clears throat> you know, between, I guess, 101 and the 
uh, west part of Redwood High School, which would be kind of the lower areas. Um, and, and yeah, the, you know, I've got some ideas, but uh, probably uh, we'll, we'll save that for a future meeting. But um, there, there are some opportunities to, um, you know, build up some some zones to protect town, the town of Corbett area if, if the other um, agencies aren't doing it closer to the, the creek itself. Okay, maybe um, a recurring agenda item could be just an update of anything you guys have heard from Larkspur or the county. Um, we've talked in the past about making sure that we're aligned with Larkspur's flood control board and um, I think it would just be good to get updates if you've heard, hey, here's what these guys are thinking or what they're not thinking. Mm -hmm. So Nathan, uh, Larkspur uh, does not actually have a flood control board. Uh, Dan Hilmer, a uh, long-term uh, council member, is the Larkspur representative for the Fa Ross Valley Flood District related to uh, Corte Madera Creek. And so they, it's really just uh, Dan Hilmer uh, who's involved in that. I've met and talked with him, you know, about uh, the need to do something at Corte Madera Creek. But I think the things that RJ and the consultants have outlined in regard to raising the levees and on uh, Lucky Drive uh, would uh, allow Larkspur and the county to utilize that and tie into it to uh, really protect Larkspur and the county properties. Yeah. But in, in a very sim you know, high level, you know, it's either, um, you know, a lot of seawalls or different types of, you know, those um, levy improvements or one mega large tide barrier yeah. or a combination of the two. And then one final observation that ties in nicely with the slide you're showing right here as far as the timing of some of these things. Um, I think it might be helpful for you guys and for us and for the public if you drew up um, a graph that showed the time, the year on the x-axis and the whatever you want for the water level mean high, high water um, on the y-axis and then showed the projections that you're using for what, you, what you're assuming the mean or the median estimate for water levels going to be in the future. So you can see the curve rising from 2020 to 2030 to 2050 knowing that's the median projection, perhaps also put the 95% the projection for sort of a worst case scenario. And then as those, as the water level rises, you can have tick marks along it saying, at this level right now, we need to deal with Lucky Drive. At this level, we need to deal with such and such. At this level, we need to deal with such and such. And that curve would be a really good short, medium and long-term guide to what needs to be done. Um, and it was when I was thinking about that graph that I thought, well, if sea level just keeps rising, the end of this graph has to say continuous seawall, you know. So that's why I was thinking that is somewhere along this line, you're going to have to stop all the water from coming in. So I think that might be helpful for us to think about this stuff. <clears throat> yeah, no, I, I think that's, um, we'll try to incorporate something like that um, that speaks to you know, elevations and tides with respect to the various alternatives for the various um, vulnerable areas. Yeah, thanks, great work, it's awesome. RJ, could you flip back one slide to the pros and cons? This one? Yes. Yep, yeah, and, and we'll, um, we'll publish this as well, or, or we'll, we'll put it on our webpage. So kind of going back to the beginning, if I, have, if I can have a moment, um, you mentioned you wanted to go final. Um, what does, what, can you clarify what final means and what is the timing? We've been advertising this to our friends and neighbors and they wanted to know how much time they have to, to provide impact. So um, to provide comment, but yeah. do you want final with a final decision or final with a firm recommendation to the council? Well, um, so we're really constrained by the Caltrans, Caltrans grant. Um, we have to have an adopted. So I mean, aside, you know, 
COVID may have bought us a couple months, but previously it was, you know, around the end of the year and, and, you know, maybe as late as February that we were supposed to have an adopted plan. And so, you know, for now that's, that's really what we're planning on. And, and that plan, um, you know, I don't think they're as, um, constrained on, on how detailed or how specific we are. I mean, obviously, you know, we want to be as specific as we can, as we're comfortable with, but I think that part is up to us, but I think they want to see that it's adopted by that time frame. So, um, so really, yeah, we are shooting for an adopted plan by, you know, end of February, I would say. <clears throat> so, um, and, and we're kind of tentatively looking at um, a couple you know, likely uh, an initial um, meeting with town council and then um, likely a second one, you know, for possible adoption. Um, so really getting a, a draft document that we're hoping to, so we're, we're looking at one, um, another public workshop this fall. Um, right now we're, we're targeting, I believe, um, October plus or minus, and that'll be kind of this, but further refined and, and with, you know, some costs um, integrated into the discussion. And then from there, um, shortly later, we would hope to have a, a draft um, climate adaptation plan kind of out and, and up for common, at least um, to agencies and stakeholders, and then at some point out to the public. And then, um, yeah, and then we'd go to council for an initial dialogue. And then um, depending if we think we're, 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 you know, building some consensus and then a final one for adoption. So that's, those are kind of the major steps in front of us. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, one advantage of your interactive, and by the way, it's, it wasn't obvious to me, but it is truly interactive. Um, uh, where as you go through it, you're asked to provide input and answer a few questions. So if, other board members haven't done that, and as you're talking to your friends and neighbors, uh, highlight that. Um, but I've been and flipping back and forth. map on the webpage, is that right? Sorry? Is that referring to the story map on the webpage? Correct, sorry, story okay. map, yes. Yeah. So I've been flipping back and forth between inner and outer, and you know, thinking outside of the box, um, maybe we could do a combination of inner for Marina Village and Outer for Mariner Cove or vice versa. Um, you know, I've been looking at where that purple line flips and where there's that kind of connection. So I don't have a firm solution, but maybe something to throw in your idea box. I think um, one of the, uh, David, I think one of the uh, thoughts on an inner approach for Marina Village would be that uh, you would uh, create more uh, valuable wetlands. Uh, you didn't have the issue of the uh, levee behind people's home, but you really have uh, created uh, more valuable wetlands there. The, with that inner solution, uh, we either need to put in a pump station for Marina Village stormwater or gravity drainage to the uh, detention pond. Any other thoughts from the uh, board members or from the uh, public? So RJ, I really want to uh, thank you, uh, the engineering department. I know you worked very closely with the uh, consultants. I thought we had some great consultants. I thought the ideas, uh, I, I agree with uh, Nate that uh, these are things these options intrinsically make sense. They need to be sort of fine-tuned and massaged so that they have, you know, less environmental impacts or, or cost impacts. But, uh, uh, you know, this is the, uh, you know, uh, first overall plan that has come up that I think uh, really uh, makes sense. Uh, there was a, a plan for a lock uh, put forward in the 80s and, I think it was clear to most people that uh, that would, uh, you know, wasn't going to really happen. But uh, it, a lot of 
energy and money was expended in trying to look at that. And I think we have much more uh, pragmatic uh, solutions uh, from our consultants in the engineering department. So thank you and thank the engineering department. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, thanks. thanks. And uh, we're just getting started. So appreciate okay. all, the, uh, all the feedback and, and, you know, all the, you know, you know, a lot of these ideas were generated from, from all of you. So um, appreciate that. Okay. Uh, future agenda items. Anybody have any specific thoughts or recommendations? Perhaps just the Larkspur kind of recurring update of what's going on with Larkspur. Okay. Well, I'll second Nathan's other idea of a, of a timeline or a graph correlating uh, potential sea level rises and its impact. So maybe uh, also it would be good to give us an update on some of these small projects that are on the list of, uh, of things to, to get done that we've had on that list for a while. Uh, they may have gotten pushed back due to funding issues, but uh, maybe just try to update us on that list that we've got. Hey, Bob, if you remember in the past, um, kind of at this time or in fall, they, we would, uh, We'd be informed of efforts the city uh, town's taken on to prepare for winter and rain, you know, kind of a public works um, maintenance. Yeah, RJ, I think, had done that uh, last year, and usually it's uh, uh, October or so. Yep. Yeah, that's uh, that's right in Chris's wheelhouse. <laughs> okay. He's our he's our mixed stock lead, so he can um, he can. Um, I'm sure you'd be happy to give you an update. Okay, very good. Uh, if there are no other discussions or items, uh, I'll adjourn the meeting. Thanks, Bob. Thank you all for attending. Uh, this was uh, very productive. All right, thank you. Very nice. All righty. Thank you.